Hello and welcome to Ion Africa. I'm Yana Lee and these are your headlines tonight. Tigrayan rebels agree to a humanitarian ceasefire with Ethiopia's federal government. The near 17-month-old conflict has killed thousands of people and left millions in need of food aid. ECOWAS leaders warn they could slap sanctions on Guinea and Burkina Faso. No major changes for Mali. The West African bloc gives the junta there another 12 to 6 months of transitional rule. And we bring you a report on the economic fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine as the price of fuel, food and fertilizer shoots up across the continent. But first, uh, Tigrayan rebels have agreed to a ceasefire proposed by the Ethiopian government on Thursday. The AU, EU, US and China have all welcomed the breakthrough, one that comes as the UN estimates that 90% of residents in Tigray are in need of food aid. The, P the TPLF and federal forces have been locked in conflict for almost 17 months now. Thousands of people have been killed. Sinead McCausland has this. After 16 months of war in northern Ethiopia, Tigrayan rebels agreed to a ceasefire following the government of Ethiopia's call for an indefinite humanitarian truce Thursday. The government of Tigray will do everything it can to make sure this cessation of hostilities is a success. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's government hopes the ceasefire will ease humanitarian aid access to the Tigray region in northern Ethiopia where almost 40% of its 6 million people face an extreme lack of food, according to the UN. No aid has been delivered since December due to what the World Health Organization calls a man-made blockade. Both the government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front deny any responsibility, but Ethiopian officials blame the TPLF as it calls on them to desist from all acts of further aggression and withdraw from areas they have occupied in neighboring regions. The conflict between the Ethiopian government and leaders of the TPLF erupted in November 2020, when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed sent troops into the region to topple the former governing party. But the fighting has led to a humanitarian crisis. Since the war began, there have been thousands of deaths, with more than nine people in Tigray and its neighbouring regions of Far and Amhara in need of food assistance. Let's uh, head over to uh, Accra next, where West African leaders uh, took part in a summit to discuss four recent coups in three different countries. The ECOWAS economic bloc called on uh, Burkina Faso and Guinea's coup leaders to revise their transitional periods and also said that uh, sanctions could uh, be gradually lifted on Mali if certain conditions are met. Now, uh, for more on this, our regional correspondent Hanan Ferjani is standing by for us. Uh, and then uh, ECOWAS hasn't budged then much on uh, Mali. Well, absolutely not, uh, Yena. The discussions went on for hours, uh, longer than they did at previous uh, extraordinary uh, summits on Mali in the past few months. And that may be a sign that uh, negotiations were tough and that ECOWAS a leader struggled uh, to find a common a ground on moving forward with the Malian situation. But eventually they did, and we've now learned that uh, they have stood at their ground, that they didn't budge on the timeline that they believe is acceptable for holding a free and fair election uh, in the country and returning to, uh, you know, r regular uh, institutions uh, in the country. In the final statement that was uh, just given to the press uh, a few minutes ago, uh, minutes ago, ECOWAS President, uh, Commission President uh, Jean-Claude Cassibrou uh, announced that the West African uh, leaders were willing to accept that tr transitional um, government um, uh, for another 12 to 16 months. This does not come uh, as a surprise because uh, this arms wrestle between Mayan authorities and uh, the ECOWAS bloc has been going on for, for months now. And although the transitional uh, government had revised its uh, initial ambitions downwards from a five-year chronogram to two years, this was not considered uh, good enough for ECOWAS last week. As for the economic sanctions, as, as you just mentioned, well, uh, it appears as though uh, ECOWAS th here again has decided to maintain its previous position and will only be uh, lifting uh, sanctions gradually if and when uh, the, 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 ex the acceptable timeline uh, is given from the uh, Mayan authorities. And uh, Hanan, what's in store for the two other uh, uncooperative members of the bloc, Burkina Faso and uh, Guinea? 
While those two countries uh, may find themselves in a similar uh, situation uh, than Mali in uh, coming months, uh, and they are now on deadline as well, uh, the bloc indeed set a, a deadline of April 25th for Guinea's uh, junta to provide a democratic transition uh, timetable. And they have also asked uh, Burkina Faso's uh, interim leaders to reduce the proposed transition of 36 uh, months to a more acceptable timeline. So uh, I think that this means that, you know, it, the next time they convene, they will probably uh, decide on, on, on sanctions, the actual sanctions, concrete sanctions against uh, those two countries if they don't uh, comply with uh, the, the proposed uh, uh, agenda of the ECOWAS. And uh, maybe it's important to note that uh, there's been quite a bit of criticism from the West African public opinion in, in recent months about the way that ECOWAS has been dealing with uh, the Malian transitional uh, authorities versus Guinea and um, Burkina Faso. And just so it seems that this time around, I guess the ECOWAS is giving this message and sending this message, which is we are going to adopt the same strategy uh, for every single uh, junta that decides to take on a coup and, and sort of just take over a regular authorities that are in power and, uh, and show them that we are being very firm and standing our ground and not uh, being um, uh, just not being relaxed about uh, this. All right. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, Hanan Fergeni reporting for us there. Next, Zimbabwe is to hold crucial by-elections this Saturday. One-tenth of the seats in the country's parliament are up for grabs, as well as 5% of local council seats. Controversially, authorities haven't given foreign journalists accreditation to cover the event. Our regional correspondent Nadine Theron has more on what's at stake. Zimbabweans are heading to the polls for the first time since President Emerson Nangangwa was elected in 2018. This time they're voting for whom they want to see in 133 parliamentary and council seats. But for the first time in the country's history, no foreign journalist will be reporting from the ground. I think as of uh, you know, 23rd of March, we had uh, about 721 uh, local observers that were accredited. We had also 17 uh, local journalists and we had 37 foreign observers uh, that were part of it, but we don't have any foreign journalists as per the, 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 the applications that the Commission has received. Local journalists aren't happy either. The mainstream media and other media organizations are going to rely on citizen journalists. That will be voting. They have to be casting their voice to send pictures, to send stories, to send videos, to send text. These by-elections are a major test ahead of the national election set for next year, and the run-up has been marked by violence. Nelson Chamisa's new opposition party is hoping to become a threat to ZANU-PF, but his supporters are being targeted. The Citizens' Coalition for Change has brought hope to many Zimbabweans who seek change from the current regime. Journalism is not a crime. That was the slogan chanted by protesters in Tunis this Friday. Dozens of people showed up outside Tunisia's journalists' union to show their support towards three colleagues who uh, appeared before an anti-terrorism court today. They were released without charge. One of them is uh, Halifa Gesmi, who was originally arrested for refusing to reveal a source. Rights groups say journalists have faced increasing pressure since President Kais Syed's power grab last July. Now, the uh, war in Ukraine might be thousands of kilometres away, but people from across the African continent are already feeling the uh, economic effects. Increases in the price of fuel, grain and fertiliser have inflicted a hefty blow to many businesses and families. From Malawi to the Maghreb, Africans are feeling the impact of the Ukraine crisis in ranging fuel and food price increases. Global oil prices have reached a decade high since Russia invaded on February 24. In Africa, they have doubled. Nigeria subsidizes petrol, but this bakery manager still pays more to bake bread. Cost of production, it has increased immensely. So they have to come together and also increase the price of bread by, by 40% to what it was before. Meanwhile, diesel and jet fuel prices are sold at market rates. Samuel Salau, a construction engineer, says the price of diesel has doubled from 310 naira or 75 dollar cents. 
within a month, it left that level to about 600 and something plus now. And so many industry is on diesel. Trucks that bring in food, stuff from the north to the south, are running on diesel. Even train runs on diesel. In Malawi, bread is much more expensive at the supermarket in the capital, Lilongwe. It is more difficult to buy bread because the price has gone up exponentially compared to before. The amount we paid for two loaves of bread is now enough only for one. We are spending more. Both Ukraine and Russia are major suppliers of wheat and other cereals to Africa, while Russia is a key producer of fertilizer. The war and international sanctions against Moscow have disrupted supply chains, up to places like Bukavu in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. We hardly produce anything, and everything that is produced does not reach the market because of the state of the roads. We are totally dependent on international supplies, and the prices are going up because of the war in Ukraine. And this is reflected here in Bukavu. This dependence has drawn concern from the UN. We must do everything possible to avert a hurricane, a hurricane of hunger and the meltdown of the global food system. The war has raised fears of even further increases in North Africa. Amid wholesale flour shortages, this bakery in Tunis has to buy consumer packets. I am buying 10 kilograms at 18 dinars when normally I would buy a 50 kilogram bag at 26 dinars. All of this before even feeling the impact of the war. How will we work afterwards? I'm worried. Thousands of civilians have been killed inside Ukraine. More than three million people have fled across its borders, and two million more are displaced inside the country. The figures are rising fast. As the conflict continues, so will its impact further abroad in Africa. Ivory Coast has eased COVID restrictions. Masks are no longer required outdoors except at large gatherings. Fully vaccinated travellers no longer need a negative PCR test. Four million Ivorians have been vaccinated so far. The WHO meanwhile called for caution on Thursday, saying that African countries must remain vigilant with testing and tracing due to low inoculation rates. And finally, 10 African teams that have been battling it out to qualify for five spots in this year's World Cup. Egypt and Senegal faced off in a much-awaited rematch since the AFCON finals. An own goal saw the Pharaohs take a 1-0 lead. Moussa Sissako has given Tunisia a head start against Mali. And Algeria's Islam Slimani's 40th-minute goal has put the Fennec Foxes ahead of Cameroon. Meanwhile, the Democratic Republic of Congo versus Morocco, also Ghana versus Nigeria, all ended in one-all draws for this uh, first leg. That's it for Eye on Africa. Tonight's show was produced by Arno Pedram and his team behind the cameras. Special event. Every five years, France 24 brings you coverage of the French presidential election. The question this year is will President Macron be re-elected for another term? Or will he be beaten by one of the candidates determined to defeat him? France 24 will cover the electoral campaign, meeting the French people, the candidates and their supporters until the vote in April. Follow the French presidential election every day on France 24 and France24.com.